We are the women who blaze trails. We are the women who fulfill purpose. We are the women who serve boldly. We are the women who honor the word sisterhood. We are the women who stand on the principle of scholarship. We are the women of Sigma Gamma Rho. Sigma women are not made, they are born. Born to change the world, born to set the standard, and born to create new paths for nearly 100 years. We embody our motto of greater service, greater progress. We empower women globally. We invest in youth through our annual youth symposium. We save lives through SWIM 1922. We speak out on injustices and will forever say her name. We don't just treat community issues, we seek to eradicate them. Socially conscious, community champions, globally focused, sisterly united, professionally positioned, fearless in well-doing. We are the women of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. And now we would like to welcome to the stage our MC for the evening, Soror Denise Fletcher, a member of Theta Epsilon Sigma Alumni Chapter in Culver City, California. And let's receive her with some applause in the chat box. Hi, greetings. Thank you all for coming out to our virtual Project Cradle Care event on tonight. We are so happy to see you virtually. Um, as mentioned, January is National Birth Defects Prevention Month. Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated created, created Project Cradle Care to provide health education, support, and resources for expectant teen mom, moms and teens who are parents. Tonight, we have several experts in the medical profession and a dynamic panelist of teen mothers. Get your notebooks, your pen, paper, and get ready to take down some valuable notes and resources that may be helpful to you or to someone you know. Coming up first, we have Mashariki Kadumu. Mashariki Kadumu is March of Dimes Maternal Infant Health Director of Greater Los Angeles. In this role, she directs programs, provides community and provider education and informs policies and system changes that improve the health of all moms and babies. Marsha Riki also represents March of Dimes on local and statewide birth equity initiatives. She serves on the Los Angeles African American Infant and Maternal Mortality Prevention Initiative Countywide Steering Committee, California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative Executive Committee, California Pregnancy Related Mortality Review Expert Committee and is chair and is Cherished Futures Collaborative Community Advisor for Cedar Sinai's Hospital. She has diverse clinical research and nonprofit experience in maternal and infant health and has lived and worked in San Francisco Bay Area, New York City, and Latin America. Marshariki has a background in social work and is trained in, and is a trained doula with experience providing labor support to pregnant women who were part of the criminal justice system or living with HIV AIDS. A lifelong justice advocate, Marshariki is committed to community-driven solutions to advance health equity and promote wellness. She has an undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley and a master's in public health from UCLA Building School of Public Health. Marshariki lives, Marshariki lives with her family in South Los Angeles and pre-COVID, she spent most of her weekends cheering on her teenage son at baseball fields and basketball courts throughout Southern California. Help me welcome Marshariki Kadumu.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Marcia Dimes is especially thankful to our partnership with Sigma Gamma Rho. We have been partners for several, several decades and are always just um, happy that we can partner together for the health of moms and babies. So happy to be here. And I have um, slides that are going to be shared. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. And as always, I'm so happy to partner with Sigma Gamma Rho for our advocacy efforts, March for Babies, um, our Premature Awareness Month. Sigma Gamma Rho always comes out in full force when we go up to Sacramento every year for our advocacy um, day. So always thankful for your leadership. Next slide. Next slide. So the March of Dimes, we really fight for the health of all moms and babies. We are one of the largest and oldest mom and baby um, health organizations in the nation. So we started back in 1938 with Franklin D. Roosevelt around polio. And then we helped fund the um, research around the polio vaccine. And once the um, vaccine was developed, we went and really focused our attention on birth defects prevention, um, prematurity, we mobilized our community, started one of the first walks um, in the nation, and then also to have been really focused, laser focused in the past several years around birth equity and making sure that all moms and babies have the best start in life and reducing the racial disparities that we see among our black moms and babies. Next slide, please. And why we're so laser focused on preterm birth and disparities, as we see this is um, data for LA County. In LA County, what we know is that black moms have a preterm birth rate that is about 66% higher than other races, women of other races. Our um, babies die at a rate um, that's two to three times higher than other babies, and our moms die at a rate that's about four times higher than other moms. And so we really want to uh, make sure that we impact this, that we work with our community um, leaders, our stakeholders, our organizations like AIM, Cherish Futures, Black um, Infant Health, Black Women for Wellness, Mighty Little Giants, to make sure that we all come together to impact this. Next slide. And this is a slide that just shows that the um, preterm birth rate and the disparity between black and white mothers is throughout all of LA County. So it's not just one section, we see that in all LA County. And why this is so important and why we're really um, wanna make sure that we address and impact preterm birth is preterm birth and its complications are the number one reason for infant death. So if we want to reduce infant mortality in the black community, we have to reduce preterm birth. And preterm birth um, can lead to um, long-term complications for children, such as cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, hearing problems, breathing problems. And these um, conditions, these complications have not only social costs, medical costs, educational costs that impact all families. Um, and so the costs for those annual costs in terms of medical, social, educational, for babies that are born preterm are about $75,000 per baby in California. And then if we know that our biggest resource, our most cherished resource is our children and our future, then we really wanna make sure we do all that we can so that every child has the best possible life. Next slide. Next slide. And so what I wanted to do today was just share some of the resources that we have that you can um, take out, you can go to the web, download, take some notes to really help um, you in your prenatal care and having conversations with your doctors and just sharing with only with for yourself, but also too with um, your partners. So Marcia Dimes has a ton of health education materials on our website. If you just go to marchadimes.org, our materials are based on facts. They're easy to read. There's everything from um, taking care of yourself before you get pregnant, um, when you're pregnant, in terms of eating right, 
exercise, common questions, how to pre, um, the signs and symptoms of preterm labor. And then if your baby is in the NICU or if there's complications, there's also too, a ton of information about um, how to take care of your baby when your baby's in the NICU and what are some of the complications. And so this is a really helpful um, information sheet around preterm birth, the signs and symptoms, and um, what you can do if you have any of these talk, reach out and talk to your doctor. So it really gives you some signs and symptoms. So you know, um, if something's not normal, not right, reach out and talk to your doctor. Next slide. And then also too, we have what we call this health action sheets um, that are around certain conditions. And this one is about um, low dose aspirin and preeclampsia. So preeclampsia um, is common in black women is one of the leading causes for death of black women. Preeclampsia is um, high, high blood pressure and protein in your urine as well as swollen limbs like your legs and um, your feet. And so, and also too preeclampsia is one of the leading causes for preterm birth. Um, a lot of doctors and clinicians believe that most black women should take low dose aspirin to prevent preeclampsia. And so low dose aspirin is baby aspirin. You can get it at the um, grocery store it's, or Walgreens 99 cent store. It's safe to use during your pregnancy. It really does, um, it's a easy and low cost um, intervention to prevent preeclampsia. And what we find out is that a lot of women don't know about it. Their doctors didn't tell them or they go to the pharmacy to get the prescription filled and the pharmacist says, well, you can't take aspirin because you're pregnant. And so this sheet, what it does is it just gives you questions to talk to your doctor, to ask them about whether or not you're a good candidate to um, be on low dose aspirin, what are some concerns um, that you have about preeclampsia. And so really what we do is encourage all black women when you're pregnant to talk to your doctor about preeclampsia, to ask them um, if you are at risk, if you're a candidate for low dose aspirin. Um, Beyonce had preeclampsia, Alex and Felix had preeclampsia. So being, you know, the world famous um, celebrity and entertainer or world famous athlete doesn't really, isn't always a protective factor. And so we wanna make sure that women know about this and they're talking to their doctor and they're not waiting for the doctor to tell them. Next slide. And then also too, we have a blog called News Moms Need. And you get, if you sign up, you get a weekly article that's on, it's a ton of um, information. So on um, preconception before you get pregnant, during pregnancy, breastfeeding, if your baby's in the NICU, we have updated it to include information around COVID. So every week there's something about COVID, um, you know, breastfeeding during, um, if you can breastfeed during COVID, um, taking care of your baby in the NICU during COVID. Um, there's information too now on the COVID vaccine and whether or not um, pregnant and lactating women should take the vaccine. And we just really encourage all women, all pregnant women to talk to um, their doctors about the vaccine and if, um, and if there's any concerns that they have, just have these conversations, make sure you're talking to your doctor and you're not waiting for them to um, talk to you about it. So bringing this up with your midwife, your doctor, your, your prenatal care provider. And so you can just go to newsmomsneed.org, sign up, you know, look at um, the glossary and see what different um, handouts and sheets there are. Next slide, please. And then also too, we have online resources. Um, and so we know, um, and support groups. So we know in this time of COVID that we're not um, meeting, that folks don't have their traditional sources of support, um, whether they can't meet with them up in person um, or they're out of state. So we do have some online support groups. We have a Facebook group. Um, we also have a mentorship group. So a mentorship for moms who've had a preterm birth or a birth defect or baby with a birth defect or have had an infant loss. Um, the mentor matched up with a woman who's had or a pregnant person who's had a similar experience or a mom who's had a similar experience. And then also too, we have um, unspoken stories, which just is, um, 
a site for women or families to share their story about um, preterm birth, birth defects or infant loss. Cause we know the more you share your story and get support, um, then you know that you're not alone in your experience. Next slide. And then also we have an app, My NICU Baby app, um, for moms that are in NICU where they can track their baby's health, they can track um, pumping and feeding and kangaroo care, they can um, list questions, they can share photos. There's also two um, health information in the um, app. And this app can be used like once your baby goes home too from the hospital. So it's just not while you're in the hospital. And it's a really good tool around tracking and feeding. And so if this is something that you want to use once your baby gets home. And so you can just download it at the Apple Store or Google Play. And it's free for everyone. Next slide. And also to want to share that the March of Dimes, we updated our birth plan to include questions around COVID um, to help you navigate these conversations with your um, prenatal care provider, your midwife, your doctor around prenatal care, labor and delivery and birth, postpartum care, um, breastfeeding. Um, during COVID, because things are changing so much in terms of just prenatal care visit or who can be with you when you go to the hospital during labor, this is just really important um, to be able to help navigate these questions, talk to your um, provider, write down what you have. And it's also um, just a, a good tool to be able to write down those questions you have before you get into the doctor's office or your midwife's office so that um, you don't forget. Um, and also to, you know, we know that people are worried about whether or not, um, you know, they'll go to the hospital and they'll be full because of the rise in COVID. This is what you can write down to and ask your provider, ask your doctor, your midwife, what um, are some of the concerns about um, your hospital and if she should go to a different hospital. But the birth plan is being used by Black Infant Health, doulas, um, breastfeeding, educators in the hospitals, also in clinics too, so widely used in California. Next slide. And then also too, just wanted to let everyone know that um, women are pregnant, um, women have had a um, mental health condition during pregnancy, such as depression or even postpartum depression. If you're on Medicaid, you are eligible to have Medicaid 12 months postpartum. And so if you've had a mental health um, diagnosis, please talk to your um, midwife about this or your doctor about it. Um, and see if you're eligible for these services. We know that, you know, some of the conditions and, um, the deaths or the maternal warning signs that happen after pregnancy happen sometimes, a lot of them happen when women lose their um, Medicaid 60 days postpartum. So it's just really important to um, talk to your provider about the C if you're eligible for this so you can keep your Medicaid. And it's not just for maternal mental health, it's also too for um, your regular health care. And the next slide. And then just have a list of community service um, resources for everyone. It's just think about um, doula care, cinnamons, breastfeeding support, um, St. Anne's, which provides housing um, and services and mental health services for pregnant and parenting young women and teens. And so um, just you know, we have a panel of experts who are going to give you more resources, but just wanted to let um, folks know about some resources, and especially the Frontline Doula Hotline, um, where you can get um, 50 minutes of a free call or text for emotional and informational support during your pregnancy. And just want to make sure that everyone is aware um, of some of the resources to help during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Next slide. And so just here's my contact information. If you have any questions or you need more information, um, if you want me to send you some of the um, handouts that I talked about, um, please reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help you in any way. And once again, just thank you to Sigma Gamma Rho and all that you do in terms of Project Cradle Care and caring for um, our young moms in the community. So thank you.
you for that wonderful information and resources that were provided. I definitely took notes. Next, we have Ajua Jones. Ajua Jones is a daughter, sister, mother, grandmother, relative, friend, and mentor to many. Her approach to life is holistic as she is eager to share messages of faith that advance the inner spirit, fervently distri distributing health-related information that encourages maintenance of a sound body. And she is enthusiastic about nourishing the intellect. Ajua began her career in the field of health with LA County Department of Health Services, DHS, as a student professional worker. While working with the immunization program, a fellow colleague recommended her for a community health worker position with great beginnings for black babies and subsequently began her work with women and children. Simultaneously, she received her BS in health science, health career administration from CSU Dominguez Hills, and most recently completed her MBA in nonprofit management at the American Jewish University. Currently, Ajua is the Associate Director of Regional Collaboration for Service Planning Area 6 with the Whole Person Care Program of the LA County Department of Health Services, DHS, and has worked within the Department of Public Health and DHS for the past 23 years, serving in various programs to improve the health and wellness for women, men, children, and their families throughout the county. She recently completed the Women's Policy Institute Fellowship 2019-2020 with the Women's Foundation of California on the LA County Health Justice Team and co-developed a doula board motion to improve the health and birth outcomes of black women and babies locally, regionally with plans for statewide. Ajua has worked to mentor and encourage numerous young men and women in the community through her work as the former youth and young adult ministry director and as a 23 year member volunteer of Black Women for Wellness, BWW. She has served as pregnant and parenting teen support group coordinator, moderator, as Shingazi's sister friend, and currently serves on and currently serves as board champion for the organization. Further, Ms. Jones has realized and spoke that as a single mother growing up in one of the most culturally diverse and economically challenged cities in the nation, I am proud of the foundation that my parents gave me because I now realize that no matter what happened in my life, my education and skills could take me anywhere my mind could imagine. I have learned how the pitfalls of change, the timing, how the pitfalls of life change the timing of your accomplishing goals, but if determined, they can never destroy the goal. Welcome, Ajula Jones. Thank you, thank you. Oh my gosh, when I hear all that, I'm like, ooh, who's she talking about? <laughs> so thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I wanna thank the ladies of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporate, Theta Epsilon Sigma Alumni Chapter for inviting me here to be here with you all on this evening. I'm just going to take a few minutes just to share. I actually, if I were to present this um, heavy load of work that we do in LA County, it takes me about an hour to an hour and a half when me and my colleagues do some presentations and we do them uh, mostly around racism and maternal health and um, Black infant health. And so uh, what I wanted to share with you all tonight is about our um, African-American Infant and Maternal Mortality Initiative, of which I am the uh, visionary for the South LA, South Bay, African-American Infant and Maternal Mortality CAT, in, um, which is the first one that we've established in the county. And so our goal and role for the CAT is to build a partnership between government and community to address the uh, issue of the impact of racism primarily on the birth outcomes and pregnancy of Black women. So what has happened uh, prior to us beginning this, we launched our first CAT in October of 2018. But prior to that, uh, there were conversations happening. The Center for Health Equity, which is a part of the a Department of Public Health, had began the task of looking at specific issues of 
inequity in LA County. And they had about five they were going to address, one of which was Black infant health. And being a one of the former uh, community health workers and perinatal health educators of the first Black infant health program here in LA County, which was Great Beginnings for Black Babies, and in my role with the Department of Health Services Whole Person Care, I knew that uh, we had to establish a community action team or support one in place, but there was nothing that was addressing black infant health solely from the community perspective or in partnership with local government. And so not only was there not one that was doing that, but there was nothing to address uh, what was happening to black moms and babies, that black moms and babies were dying at high rates. And so what infant, mort let me just say what infant mortality is. It is the death of an infant before their first birthday. As it applies to maternal mortality, it's a death of a woman while pregnant, during labor, delivery, or within one year of the end of a pregnancy from either a complication uh, related to that pregnancy, a chain of events initiated by pregnancy, or the aggravation of an unrelated condition by the physiologic effects of pregnancy. And so I share that with you and then go back and say that what had happened in the county is that we were finally starting to hear that one of the main leading causes of such for Black infant health was racism. Racism being one of the leading causes for infant mortality. Infant mortality in LA County is such that we lose Black babies at two to three times the rate of white babies in um, Los Angeles County, California as well. As well for black moms, we're losing black moms at three to four times the rate of white women. And so what that looks like in numbers for us is that, for example, for black babies, we lose about, according to CDC, approximately 4,000 babies, black babies annually. So imagine that broken down in LA County at that rate and see how many we're losing that we could do the work to change. At the same time, um, Moms Rising did a depiction, or actually it comes out of an article from Lost Mothers, where NPR did a study um, on the death of Black moms. And one of the studies they addressed was, or not a study, an article, where they had a conversation about Shalon Irving, who worked for CDC, who was a Black woman in her early 30s, had multiple degrees, and had passed within, I want to say it was about three weeks of giving birth to her daughter. And why was that? And so we, in looking at that, they saw that many missed, uh, ish, many things happened that were missed by the providers that could have been addressed. And then there was also the misreading of her blood pressure, which, you know, is very important if you have preeclampsia, which is, you know, hypertension related to your pregnancy or postpartum. And this young lady died and didn't have to. And so how... CDC, re, um, the depiction of the art in the article of how they related Black women dying in America is that Black women in the U.S. are 243 percent more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. And this does not have anything to do with uh, your socioeconomic background, whether you're college educated, it has nothing to do with whether you are wealthy. It has nothing to do with whether you're impoverished. It just has something to do with the fact that black women are often not listened to here in America when it comes to expressing themselves with providers about what they're experiencing during their pregnancy. And so we've had these stories, um, you know, uh, Charles Johnson, the son of Judge Hatchett, shares his story about his wife, uh, Mrs. Kira Johnson. And Kira died at one of our local hospitals here after going, you know, after they were ignored or not respond, the doctors were not responsive to what they saw happening um, to her body where she was bleeding internally and they could see the blood. He could see the blood in the catheter and they told him, uh, you know, things like your wife is not the priority. And by the time they operated on her eight to 10 hours later, there were so many liters of blood in her stomach and she died and she didn't have to. And so these are the stories that we're hearing routinely. And sadly, there is something that we could do about it, but it's often not anything done about it. So here's why we created the AIM-CAT. 
Um, here's why we asked our community, hey, this is what is happening. We brought it to the community and we said, what would you like to do about it? If we were to provide or bring together this community action team, are you interested? We had over a hundred folks show up to Kaiser Baldwin Hills. Shout out to Kaiser, Celia Brugman and Janae Oliver for their support and all that we're doing. And, and a lot of the physicians, nurses and staff over there, they have been wonderful in looking at how they could start to address racism in um, maternal health and how they could change the lives of black moms and babies. The same can be said of our Department of Public Health and Department of Health Services and Department of Mental Health. So we called together with community members, mothers, fathers, doulas, um, nurses, uh, just faith-based uh, organizations, uh, community-based organizations, clinics. And we've been meeting together since October, 2018. Our community action team of which you can become a member I will provide my email address and telephone number, but our community action team is comprised of five work groups. We have policy and advocacy, the funder circle, um, integrative community solutions, uh, community outreach and engagement. And I'm going to, they're going to get me because I'm about to miss one, but I, I will pull that up at any rate. What we're doing is we have community members that have come together that are pulling their intellect, their expertise and resources to see what strategies we can and interventions we can come up with to impact and change the lives of black moms and babies. That's how you have the doula program, uh, which is a pilot program, whole person care funded uh, DPH for a pilot program. And they've been providing services to black women for uh, free doula services for over a year. It's now expanded for a couple of years. Uh, we also have three other cats that were formed in San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, and Antelope Valley. You can too be a part of this because our mission and goal, especially from the cat, is to impact uh, racism and other root causes of health disparities by catalyzing community action and promoting wellness and equitable healthcare strategies for African American and Black families. Let me say this we have not forgotten our brothers. Black dads are very much involved and very much a part of this. Partners are a part of this work. We have Black Daddy Dialogues, which was our first. Um, actual program to the community where fathers can come together. It was created by black men for black men, or if you're parenting black children um, to per, to just dialogue and see how important and critical it is for men to be involved in the pregnancy, in the birth outcomes, and to know that their mother, their babe, their spouses, I'm sorry, their spouses, girlfriends, partners, friends, aunts, cousins, sisters are at risk their babies are at risk and how important it is and critical for them to come out the um, car for, into the waiting room, into the hospital room, uh, don't drop off and leave, but really get engaged in the process. That was pre-COVID. And now with COVID, um, you know, rules have changed, but we're still working through that. At least you could still get on the phone and FaceTime or whatever while someone's on the visit. And so those are some of the things we're doing. I will tell you, you can find us on Facebook, follow us at Black Infants and Families Los Angeles, and you can learn more about our work. My number I can be reached at is 213-572-9747. As well, you can um, email me and I will make sure they provide my email address, adjones at dhs.lacounty.gov. Thank you. Hey, Gems, I love the idea of Black Daddy Dialogues. It's much needed, awesome. So surprising that Black women, 243% more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. It's so staggering. So happy that we have these committees and things formed. Next, we have Sean Jordan. Sean Michelle Jordan is a certified nurse, midwife, and high-risk perinatal practitioner in Los Angeles, California. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing, BSN, from Mount St. Mary's College and her RN license in 1986. She received her Certificate of Nurse Midwifery and Women's Well women's health practitioner license in 1995 from Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science. Sean obtained a master's of science in nursing 
and 2000 from Cal State University, Long Beach. Over the past 26 years, Sean has delivered thousands of babies and counts it a joy and a privilege to bring new lives into the world. She has also been concerned about both the physical, emotional, and spiritual well being of those under her care, particularly young women and teens. She is very passionate about her profession and uses every opportunity to mentor, inspire, and educate women from all cultural, educational, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Currently, Sean provides prenatal care and family planning services at St. John's Well Child and Family Centers, one of the largest federally qualified healthcare centers in Los Angeles County, serving underserved communities. Sean also serves as an ordained minister, having earned a certificate in theology and religion from Princeton Theological Sem Seminary. She is the mother of three amazing daughters and also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. It is Sean's hope that the quality care and compassion she provides to her patients and their families will always have a lasting impact on their lives. Thank you. Welcome, Sean Jordan. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. I want to first say thank you to the illustrious women of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be a part of this amazing project and to share this um, atmosphere with these other wonderful uh, women on this panel. Um, I come to you um, to talk with you a little bit about prenatal care, as we've already discussed that it is um, premature uh, and, and pregnancy and uh, birth defect prevention and awareness month. Um, and we know that part of um, getting a handle of that and preventing um, those defects and those those um, conditions is to start prenatal care and to start it as early as possible. We know that becoming a new mom is such a great uh, privilege and a joy, but we also know that it can be very challenging and isolating, especially now in the midst of the this pandemic. Um, but it can be challenging um, as well as rewarding. And so I like to focus on those things that are positive. And that's my goal um, is to share with you some information about how important it is to start prenatal care and to get prenatal care as soon as possible. As you heard in my bio, yes, I work for St. John's Well Child and Family Centers, which is a federally health qualified centers. We have 12 community uh, based uh uh, clinics, as well as five um, on-campus um, uh, clinics at Lincoln High School, Manual Arts High School, Washington Prep um, high, high, high School, as well as Hyde Park Elementary and Dominguez High School. Um, we also have a mobile clinic that goes out and helps and seeks out those needing help uh, health care that are homeless. And so I'm so proud to work for this organization because we really do try to bridge the gap in those medical and those prenatal care disparities that we find amongst minority uh, women and um, young women. And so um, I wanted to just say to you um, that it's important to start prenatal care as early as possible to develop a relationship with your provider, whether it's your midwife or nurse practitioner or your physician. That is, or, uh, that is key. Um, one of the key things to having a healthy pregnancy is to start your prenatal care as soon as possible, preferably um, within the first trimester, we're talking about within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, because we do during that time do some prenatal screening tests um, that allow us to see if you're at risk of having uh, uh, birth defects, a child with birth defects or uh, Down syndrome and so and, and other uh, chromosomal defects. And so it's important to start your prenatal care as soon as possible so that you can um, get those tests done, as well as starting on your vitamins and your, we recommend prenatal vitamins, folic acid, calcium, um, and also um, iron uh, 
just because most people, especially young women, tend to not eat the best well-balanced meals. Even though we encourage that, we want to help to supplement your diet um, at St. John's as well as other, um, I'm sure other um, facilities and other providers provide have a CPSP program, Comprehensive Prenatal uh, education uh, program. And in that, uh, we service all women that are pregnant. That comprehensive prenatal service program provides education um, on nutrition, where you see a nutritionist, uh, psychosocial mental health services, where you're able to see a therapist or uh, a psychologist. Also, referrals are made for uh, group uh, therapy as well as support groups. We also have uh, dental services because it's important as a part of your prenatal care that you should uh, have a dental checkup in your right after the, you complete the first trimester. Because what a lot of people don't know is that if you have some uh, brewing uh, dental caries or, or, or cavities that haven't been tended to before you got pregnant, if you don't take care of them and you don't take calcium and don't get your teeth examined and the dental work that you need, you can actually lose your teeth during pregnancy. So calcium is really important um, to take. Um, it's also good for your joints because the baby takes the calcium from you and will be, you will get cramps in your legs. It, when the baby takes your calcium, your joints may hurt a bit more, your gums may bleed a bit more and your teeth will become loose. And so um, that's a common finding. So these are components that the CPSP program provides. And like I said, most uh, facilities also have that program. Um, also, we, we refer out, of course, uh, for ultrasounds. You have first ultrasound usually is done um, between 11 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. That's called a nuchal translucency test. And that ultrasound is done um, where they measure the fold behind the baby's neck to see if those measurements fall within the parameters. If, they're, uh, if they do not, you may show that you're at risk of having a baby with Down syndrome. And if that occurs, then further consultations um, with a perinatologist, which is a high risk OB provider would be made. Um, and then the second ultrasound most of the time is the anatomy ultrasound, which is done right around 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. And I know all of you out there say that's the ultrasound that everyone comes in looking for because they want to know what, they want to know what they're having. And I understand that that's what you're looking for, but we're looking for something a little bit more important than that. We're looking to make sure that everything on your baby is formed um, uh, correctly. And by the way, we'll let you know if it's a boy or a girl, if we're sure that we can see what you're having. But those types of ultrasounds are really important for us to navigate and make sure that you are on target and that your baby's growth is on track and that you're not developing any problems. And then I like to um, do a third trimester ultrasound just once again to assure that baby is on track and that we haven't developed any late, um, uh, late problems in the pregnancy. But with all of that being said, I just want to also let you know that there's programs and other resources. We've heard a great deal of information and resources from uh, Marshariki, which was wonderful, and uh, Ajua, which was wo absolutely wonderful. I also want to tell you about the Welcome Baby programs. Most hospitals, a lot of the hospitals in LA County, um, several have the Welcome Baby program. So you don't have to come to St. John's to participate in the Welcome Baby program. Just check with your provider. But what the Welcome Baby program is, it's a free voluntary program for women of uh, LA, supported by the first five of LA. And it supports pregnant women um, and new moms in LA County. And it provides resources um, uh, from trusted uh, partners during the pregnancy and throughout the baby's first nine months. So you have um, an opportunity to have resources, you have parenting, they have home visits, um, you have a lactation consultant that will help you with breastfeeding and they give a lot of really great gifts. And so that is a great program for you to connect with. So please ask your healthcare provider about Welcome Baby program and see if the hospital that you plan to deliver at is involved in that program. Um, 
The other component that I just um, would not want to leave out is psychosocial. It is so important. Attitude matters. And I know you guys have heard that before, but positivity is key. And so my goal as a healthcare provider, and I believe most of us, all of us um, are in agreement, is that our goal is to keep you I'm content to keep you encouraged, to keep you inspired, um, just because you may be young and you may be a teenager with an unplanned pregnancy, or maybe it was a planned pre pregnancy, but we're not here to judge. Our goal is to support you, to love on you, and to let you know that is not the end of your life. It is the beginning of your life, okay? And so you can do this, and we're here as your partners and as your providers and your resource people to assure you that you have what it takes to have a healthy pregnancy and a, and a wonderful labor experience and beyond. So we're here to support you with parenting, with um, spiritual guidance, uh, reassurance, um, psychosocial, uh, mental health uh, issues, postpartum depression, anxiety, and select just adjusting to life. We all need help sometimes with adjusting to life, especially right now. So I just want to say to you, um, uh, just continue to move forward and seek out all of the wonderful resources and all these wonderful people that have resources that can help you and assure that you have a very healthy and safe pregnancy and a positive um, experience. Okay, thank you. Wow, thank you, Sean, thank you. Relationship and, and uh, relationship development is so key. Um, I do know this because Sean delivered my nephew, and she definitely is one to show uh, the compassion um, and treat each family as uh, a human family being. So appreciate that. Next, we have Miss Latanya Botshikan. I know I butchered the name. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Ms. LaTanya is a certified nurse midwife who has practiced at Kaiser Permanente for 30 years. She began her advanced nursing career at the age of 22 as a women's health nurse practitioner. She currently provides comprehensive women's health, prenatal care, postnatal care, and inpatient delivery services at Kaiser Hospital. She is also a graduate nursing and family nurse practitioner instructor at West Coast University where she has been teaching for seven years. She received her bachelor and master of science degrees in nursing from California State University, Long Beach, her nurse practitioner degree from Harbor UCLA and her nurse midwifery degree from San Jose State University. She is currently married with two adult daughters and is a proud member of the Divine Nine representing Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Welcome Ms. Latanya Boschikan. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to, everyone has been so amazing. I just really, truly consider it an honor to be on this panel with all these illustrious women, um, just taking care of our community, the women in our community. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me, um, Sigma, Gamma, Sigma Gamma Rho and the March of Dimes for this conference. Um, Racial disparities in our community is real, as you've heard um, our illustrious speakers speak on. And we really, as healthcare providers, we really have to give really good care and teach our women how to advocate for themselves to make sure that they're getting the care that they deserve. Um, I currently work at Kaiser Inglewood and Kaiser West LA, where I service um, predominantly black and brown women. And most of my women are high risk um, patients. And so my goal, as Sean said, is just to provide emotional support, spiritual support, um, just to really help uplift them and decrease those numbers that Ms. Jones spoke of earlier. And she is right, black women die. It does not matter what your degrees are, your socioeconomic status, our black and brown women are dying at high, high rates. And so it's really up to us as advocates, as community leaders, as healthcare providers to really help and lower these numbers. Um, I'm gonna speak on postpartum care. So Sean, who is my dear friend uh, and fellow midwife spoke on all of the prenatal care issues, but what happens in postnatal care 
or that many people don't come to their appointments. So um, if I can bring my slides up, please. We want to talk about the importance of once you have the baby and the baby's at home and you're adjusting to taking care of this little love muffin, we want to start talking about postnatal care and what you're looking for after you have the baby. Um, as um, we talked earlier about that prenatal care and we talked about the death rate, but there are also um, the same high blood pressure, diabetes, bleeding, many, many, many African-American women at a rate about three times some of other races, black women die after they have the baby. And so we talked about taking aspirin, we talked about all those things, but wanna talk about some of the things that you wanna look for um, after the baby is born. Next slide, please. So when a woman has a baby, we wanna talk about her physical, physically, how is she doing? How much rest is she getting? Is she sleeping at night? Is she still bleeding? What does that look like? Is her blood pressure elevated? Did she have any medical conditions during the pregnancy that we still need to survey? How is the baby feeding? How much support does she have? Especially during COVID, what we have found now during COVID are that our, our postpartum depression rate has increased during COVID because before you had your entire family, and especially in the African-American community, we know we typically have a village that helps us raise our children. However, now many women are isolated because of COVID. We have, you know, the mother that has to stay to themselves. Family can't come visit. You don't have support of that extended family. So really what is postpartum depression looking like? You know, usually I know when I had my kids, my mom, I was like, oh, mom, I'm coming to your house or so you're coming to mom, coming to my home. You know, we had that support. We had help. Now women aren't getting that help. So they're up every two hours. Baby's crying. They're trying to get adjusted, especially for our young mothers. They don't have that support. So we really want to, in our postpartum visit, really want to find out how much support we have and how we're adjusting and adapting to having this new baby. Next slide, please. Once we have this new baby, there are a lot of changes that go on in the mother's body that we really sometimes don't even think of. So there are changes in the blood volume. Once you have a baby, you have an increased blood volume. So once that baby is born, it takes about six weeks for that to go back to normal. Um, what our previous speaker talked about, high blood pressure. High blood pressure um, diabetes, medical conditions. If we do not have these postpartum exams and we don't follow up on if the blood pressure is elevated, are those blood sugars coming back down to normal levels? These are all causes, of, especially in the African-American community, why African-American women die during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. The postpartum period is considered that first six weeks after the baby is born. And typically there is not an appointment during that time. So part of my job as a nurse midwife is when, when we start coming to the end of the pregnancy, after I deliver the baby, I am telling my mothers, look, these are the things that I need you to look for after you have the baby. Headaches. Are you having headaches? Are you bleeding? How is the bleeding? What is going on? I really want them to be concerned about their blood pressure, how what the blood loss is, making sure that they're taking care of themselves as well as taking care of their babies. Next slide, please. Lokia. Lokia is that blood that after you have the baby, I always tell my patients, you go 40 weeks without bleeding. So once that baby comes, you have to make up for lost time. So you mothers will bleed after the baby. But what is normal? you know, how much bleeding should I have? So really want to talk about what this bleeding looks like after you have the bleed, the baby, the first two weeks, that blood should be bright red and it can be really heavy. However, once you start going a week, seven days, 10 days, 14 days out, that bleeding should get lighter. The flow should get lighter. And we really want to make sure Here's when we talk about women dying. Um, a lot of times women will call and they will ask questions. And a lot of African-American women, especially our teenagers, they're put off or terms are used that, that they don't understand. I want, I want to empower our teenagers. If you are having a problem and you call your healthcare provider, they can only get off the phone if you let them. 
ask the questions. If they are, if they're using terminology that you don't understand, slow them down. Lokia, what does that mean? I don't know what Lokia means. Well, what do you mean? How much, how much, how many pads? Oh, if you're bleeding heavy. Well, wait, stop. What does heavy mean? One pad, two pads. Make sure that you are slowing your providers down. Make sure they are answering the questions and the terminology that you understand. And a lot of times we don't want to pretend like we understand everything or someone will use a, a word that we don't get. If it means that you save your life by asking the question, you ask them the questions, you slow them down and ask the questions to make sure that you are understanding what they are saying to you. Next slide, please. Here are some of our postpartum warning signs that I just really want everyone, you know, once you have the baby, I really want you to look for. If you are soaking a pad, that means if you are bleeding so much that your pad is soaked and you're changing that pad every hour for more than two, three hours, that's a problem. If you have bright red, bright red bleeding that's going on the second week, the third week, and it's really, really heavy, that's a problem. If you're having a temperature, one of the things that we are finding now with COVID is every time you cough, every time you have a sniffle, every time you have a headache, everybody is relating everything to COVID. Well, people still have high blood pressure and people still have diabetes. And so if you're like, no, I've been at home, I haven't been exposed to COVID, make sure that you are speaking and you continue to speak until you get your story told. So if you're having severe headaches, if you're having any visual disturbances, if your family comes and says, wait, you just passed out or your eyes rolled in the back of your head. That could have been a seizure. Really want to make sure that you are following up chest pain, shortness of breath, pain with urination, any pus. Those are all symptoms that we really want you to look for. So the physical symptoms are really, really important, but the emotional, as Sean just spoke of, the emotional concerns are really, really important to us as well. Next slide, please. The vast majority of of patients um, will have some sort of postpartum depression. And postpartum depression just is, you know, you have the baby, you're tired, you don't have a lot of energy, this baby is waking up every two hours, but this typically goes away in about the first two weeks. After the first two weeks, the baby starts to sleep a little longer, you start to get a little bit more rest, so you're feeling good. But after week two, week three, week four, if you're still crying, if you don't have any energy, if you don't really want to have any conversations with your family, then we start looking at, hmm, something's going on. So postpartum depression usually is, I'm just, I have no interest in daily activities. I just don't feel like myself. Um, this is real. It has been found in the African-American community that we don't like to go to counseling. We don't feel like mental illness happens in our communities, but it does. If you cut your hand or you break your leg, you are going to go to a doctor to help fix that cut or fix that break. Well, the same is true for emotional issues. If you are feeling sad, if you are crying, if you just don't feel like you're connected, if due to COVID, you're feeling like you have cabin fever and you just can't get out of the house, there are so many community resources. You can call your healthcare provider the same way you would get that broken leg set. We have to get our mind set and we have to get on a track where we know that everything is going to be okay. We have been told to pray and prayer works, but sometimes we need to get some medical and emotional help along with prayer. And we want to make sure that we are treating ourselves spiritually, but we want to also treat ourselves physically. We want to treat ourselves emotionally. There is also what's called postpartum psychosis. And that's when I've had patients who say, well, you know, I'm not getting a lot of sleep. So I was seeing things or hearing things, but I thought it was just lack of sleep. Absolutely not. If it gets to the point that you are hearing voices, if you are seeing things, that is a medical emergency. And please, you may go to any emergency room. One of the things that I always tell my pregnant patients is that there are two areas in every hospital that cannot turn you away, labor and delivery and the emergency room. So you do not have to wait and go to the place near your home 
you can go to any hospital. Okay, you guys, we're gonna go really fast. The other thing we wanna talk about is breastfeeding. Next slide. Breastfeeding is really important. Breastfeeding helps with the bonding of the baby. Breastfeeding also helps with, um, it decreases any issues that the baby may have. It decreases colds. It increases IQ status of the baby. Next slide. So we really want to make sure that we encourage breastfeeding. We want to make sure that we encourage bonding. You can also pump your milk so dads can be involved. Next slide with breastfeeding. We always want to want to help dads get involved in the pregnancy and with breastfeeding. Some of the advantages are just that it really bonds with the baby. It's low cost. And we want to make sure that our babies are getting the best care. Um, we can go to um, family planning really, really quickly. The One of the major reasons of, of our postpartum visit is our uh, family planning. We have family planning. We have found that if we can delay breastfeeding, if we can delay a follow-up pregnancy, that increases the trajectory of our um, patients' lives. Next slide, please. So we have all sorts of issues in breastfeeding. We also want to do what we call pregnancy spacing. Pregnancy spacing is where we space the um, pregnancies. We have found now that if we space our pregnancies between 12 months and 18 months, that decreases the risk of premature labor that increases our um, fetal um, weight of our babies, and it really helps in our subsequent pregnancies. I am out of time, but I am Latanya Bashikin from Kaiser Inglewood. Just want to make sure that you guys know that if you don't have insurance or you have any issues, um, Los Angeles County Prenatal Clinics provide all of the prenatal care. They provide contraception. And just know my, my main take home point is that when you are in the room with the provider, slow them down, make sure they're using the terms that you understand, ask every question that you have, and know you don't ever have to leave that room until your questions are answered. Good luck, God bless, and I wish everyone well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latanya. Both you can. Um, I have uh, Latanya to praise for the birth of both of my children, my 14 year old and my seven year old. And so I know that she is a strong advocate and um, practices what she preaches as far as a slowing down and explaining everything for prenatal, postnatal and the breastfeeding process. Thank you, Latanya. Next, we have Jessica Wade. Jessica Wade is the founding president CEO of Mighty Little Giants. She has spent the last 10 years working in her community, advocating for underserved women, children, and families. Her passion for NICU families and mothers experiencing preterm births developed as a result of her personal experience being hospitalized on total bed rest for eight weeks prior to delivering her first son 12 weeks premature prematurely. Once her son was released from NICU, after, after his 143-day stay, she made a promise that she would do everything in her power to help families that experience similar situations. Jessica is a certified doula, a lactation education specialist with a bachelor's degree in early childhood administration. She is also a proud member of the following committees and organizations. Patient and Family Advisory Committee, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, Parent, Our Committee, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, Home Visitation Advisory Board, Antelope Valley Partners for Health, Cherished Futures for Black Moms and Babies, Antelope Valley Community Advisor, African American Infant Maternal Mortality Planning Committee, Antelope Valley, Perinatal Equity Initiative, NICU Project Steering Committee, Breastfeed LA, Antelope Valley Breastfeeding Coalition. Welcome, Ms. Jessica Wade. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, you guys. I am Jessica Wade, and I am the founder of Mighty Little Giants. I am so grateful uh, just to be here, to be able to share this space and give you guys some information, share my story, and let you guys know what Mighty Little Giants is doing now. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, guys, because I could talk all day. Um, let me just make sure I do this right. Okay, so let's share. Okay, perfect. Am I sharing? Okay, perfect. There we go. 
So, um, uh oh. Present. Okay, perfect. I hope I'm sharing correctly. I cannot see anybody. So, um, Thank you guys once again. So Mighty Little Giants, we are a nonprofit organization who supports families who have babies in the NICU. And so before I get started on my slides, I always like to start with my why because that will lay out the foundation of everything else. So um, when me and my husband found out we were pregnant with our first child, we were so excited, went to the doctor. The doctor told us that we were pregnant, but we were pregnant with empty sacs. So we need to do an emergency DNC. And so I didn't know, what that meant, right? So she tells us that there's no heartbeat and that she wanted to do an, an emergency DNC to remove the baby. We weren't comfortable with that. I didn't understand that. Um, we asked if we could schedule it a couple weeks out. We did. We came back and we found two heartbeats. So in that moment, our my pregnancy just really, really started very dynamic and different. And so um, with that, I knew something was wrong with my body. Like I was learned I, to trust what I was going through, trust what I felt. And um, because I knew something was wrong between about seven weeks pregnant and 21 weeks pregnant, I went to urgent care seven times. And every time I went, I was I left with no support services. All they told me was to put my feet up and my water broke at 21 weeks. Turns out I was miscarrying one of the one of the babies and um, I ended up being on hospital bed rest for eight weeks. And our baby was born at 27 weeks and six days. He spent 143 days in the NICU. And um, during that time, me and my husband, just because you have a baby in the NICU doesn't mean life out of the NICU stops, right? So we went through a lot, lost everything, house, cars, jobs, you name it, but each other, we kept each other. And so that's all that really mattered. And our son was okay. And with all of that, that started Mighty Little Giants. My heart is so in it. I have so much passion for mothers um, who experience what I'm what we experience and fathers and birthing people. And so now I'll get into it. So Mighty Little Giants, and these are some of my babies, you guys. So Mighty Little Giants. Mighty Little Giants is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization that advocates for mothers and fathers experiencing preterm deliveries resulting in long-term stays in hospital NICUs. Our mission is to bridge and stand in the gap for families with babies in the NICU by embracing our core values, which are integrity, compassion, and encouragement, ultimately giving them the peace in the midst of their storm. So um, these are some of the programs that we offer at Mighty Little Giants. We offer our NICU support program, and that is what it is. We go into, well, pre-COVID, we will go into hospitals and we um, host events, we do workshops. I bring in art and we use art as therapy. We call that our craft and conversation sessions. It's just something so amazing that happens when you get people that are going through the same storm in the same room, doing something at the same time. It's just like, that's where healing happens where you can be honest and transparent and it's so uplifting for the families and we become a, a forever family. And um, then we also have our life after the NICU program. And what that is, is a program to support families as they adjust to their new normal. For me and my husband, the day our son was discharged, it was the best day of our life, but it was also the scariest because you go from some place that's such a controlled environment to some like a house that you have to create your new normal and that is, to be honest, out of control. Like having a baby in the NICU is such a traumatic experience. So you have to rebuild everything. I was trying to, we were rebuilding our marriage. We were rebuilding what our life looked like as we introduced this baby to our home with that was had special needs on oxygen 24 hours a day, had medicine around the clock therapist coming in three times a week had was on heart monitors all day. And so it was super traumatic for me to the point where I was in a dark place. I um, had postpartum depression really bad and didn't really realize it. I'm normally always happy. I cover a lot up with a smile. And so through this process, I really learned how to push through. And with our life after the um, life after the NICU program is where we support mothers and ask, how are, how are you doing? What are you doing to mother yourself during this time? Have you had a break? Have you taken a walk? And when we notice that they are having those postpartum depression symptoms, then we're able to connect them with resources to help them support them as well. And then our Mighty Little Angels program, you guys, this program is so near and dear to my heart. This program is for families whose babies don't make it out of the NICU, who transition over and um, we provide them peer-to-peer -peer grief support and link them with other um, resources that can help them as well. So NICU moms need doula services too. Um, 
as I created Mighty Little Giants, I wanted to help in so many ways because I needed help from my first appointment to the day our son was discharged and beyond. And so I became a certified doula and uh, most of my doula services are focused more towards the postpartum area and for NICU moms. Within that, I provide NIC, um, support and advocacy um, with my moms. Because I experience the NICU, I feel like I'm able to support them in a different way as they go through their NICU experience, answer questions, tell them how to advocate, tell them to request a family meeting, attend the rounds. These are the questions that are good to ask. Um, um, so I support in that way. And then I also have lactation education. And so with that, I'm a um, certified lactation education specialist, just teaching the moms about their body, especially in the NICU. Just because you're separated from your baby um, doesn't mean that you can't develop breast milk and they just need that love and compassion and encouragement. Our bodies are magic. We can do all things. Like I'm convinced we can do all things. And so um, that's something that I support my moms with. And also natural remedies. It's so important um, to introduce yourself to just different teas, diffusers, oils, and just different natural things. Because just because you have a baby in the NICU doesn't mean that you skip over that postpartum period. You just had a baby. And in addition to that, NICU mommies are grieving. They're, they're grieving their birthing experience. They're grieving not being able to take their baby home. They're grieving not even being able to do their maternity shoot. Um, baby showers, all kinds of stuff. And so um, giving them that emotional support as well um, as they go through their experience. And so that's our NICU flyer, um, our our um, doula flyer. And then I just wanted to list my contact information. I know I'm running short on time, but um, that's our website. We're implementing a lot of new programs. Um, we're providing essential self-care kits for moms. And we're also um, introducing Mighty Meals and Wheels, where we'll be able to provide um, um, transportation support, as well as um, financial support for um, families, because there was a time where we had to decide lunch or go to the NICU, and you should never have to do that. And so we want to stand and bridge the gap um, for our families as they go through their journey. Thank you, guys. Wow. Thank you, Jessica, for that beautiful testimony, and then also for just reminding us to trust our own bodies um, and to advocate for ourselves. What an awesome group of beautiful, educated, and supportive women we just heard from. Thank you, ladies, for your knowledge and resources shared from our presenters. As a um, reminder, it was running across the screen. Description and links for all of our presenters can be found at sgrowculvercity.com. Again, that's sgrowculvercity.com under National Projects. Take a look at that. You can look at um, all of the descriptions and links again at sgrowculvercity.com. Right now, drum roll please, we want to do a raffle. So we want to raffle off two items. Our first item is a $10 Amazon gift card. Who's going to be the lucky winner? I'm excited. Let's see. Is it me? Minnie Murray. Minnie Murray, you just won a $10 Amazon gift card. Congratulations. Our next item that we're raffling off is an eight pack of shower bombs. I've heard that they are magnificent in the shower. Self-care is important. Eight pack shower bombs. Who's going to be the lucky winner? Jessica Wade, awesome. Congratulations, Jessica. We appreciate you. Yay. Great. Next up, we're going to welcome some of our teen mothers. We have a select group of teen mothers that are going to be joining us. Miss Brittany Daniels, Angel Dobin, Yvette Wren, Renisha Woods. Please forgive me if I pronounce your names wrong. Charge it to my head, not my heart. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, great. So what we're going to do, we're just going to begin by you guys just sharing a little bit of your journey as a teen mother. What was that like? What resources, you know, what were, were available for you? What resources did you want to be available for you? Who, who would like to start? Just jump in. Start. I can. Um, so I was. Um, 
I was 18 when I found out I was pregnant. I had just graduated high school. Um, two months after I graduated high school, I found that I was pregnant. So, um, of course, um, things that I thought were going to be um, my future had drastically changed. I didn't go to um, Northern as I had planned. I uh, switched over to Chicago State University. Um, and then um, I pretty much, even though uh, I was still with the father at the time, which um, I used whatever resources I had available. Um, anyone wanted to help, I was okay with that. Um, I took my daughter to daycare at three months. Um, I would go there an hour early before my classes would even begin and I would sit with her. So uh, at, at, at that point, it was um, all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you for sharing. I praise you for your strength to be able to go to class. <laughs> and to baby. That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share their journey? Any resources um, that they wanted? Go ahead. Do that. It was kind of the same for me. Um, I found I was pregnant my freshman year, though, of high school. <laughs> and so um, they, nobody would let me drop out. My teachers, I had a great support system. My gym teacher actually said to me, <laughs> she said, you can still do everything else the other girls are doing. So I don't want you to get lazy. Like you can still, like this will make your pregnancy and your labor easier. So I stayed in um, school until I delivered her, um, Brianna. And um, after I delivered her, found babysitting and everything and just kept going. Um, graduated from high school. And then uh, that same high school that I graduated from, she will become salutatorian of that high school that I graduated from. And then went on to Howard University, graduated with her bachelor's degree, and um, is now at University of Illinois at Chicago getting her master's degree. So it can be done. <laughs> My family was the biggest support. Like if you have family, that's the most important thing. But um, yeah, just you. It's hard to say keep going, but the baby, Brianna, was my motivation. Sorry, that was okay. amazing. Would you like to share <laughs> the last person? Hello, can you guys hear me? The, now I can. I see the Rare O Project. Would can you like me? to share your, your journey? Oh no, I think you froze. I'm sure it was an amazing testimony. Well, as we're waiting for um, her to join us again, here. any words of encouragement that you may have that you want to so, uh, again, my name on those that are listening? Oh, wait. Go ahead. I'm the Oh no. I think the connection is not as strong, unfortunately. So as she's reconnecting, did either Renisha or Yvette, did you want to share like any words of wisdom, um, any advice for those teen moms that are out there listening? Um, you have to find your your why. And I think your your baby, your son or daughter becomes your why. Um, back in the 90s when I got pregnant, people were dropping out. <laughs> people were like, okay, I got a baby and I'm going this route. Um, but I, I just thought to myself that 
I wanted her to see me do, like I, I thought if she saw me do it, then she would do it. So that was she was my biggest motivation to, you know, go to college, get my bachelor's degree, um, because I wanted her to see me do that so she can repeat that. Yeah, um, I'm kind of in the real estate. And so um, the biggest thing for me, um, I met her father. I was totally young and he was definitely older. And she's been through a lot of struggles. So I, um, we've been through domestic violence and things of that nature. And I just want them to know and to understand that that is not your end. Um, there's so many things that can be accomplished if you just keep going. And I unfortunately didn't fulfill my dream, but I push hard for her and I do everything that I need to do for her to make sure that she's doing everything that she needs to do or has everything that she needs so that she can fulfill what her destiny is. And she's doing that. She's in several programs. She's um, tutoring. She's a, uh, taking double courses for college. She's an AP. Um, so um, I struggled personally so that she could blossom. And she's like taking off. And she's been an example to her younger three siblings. And it's going to be hard. And I encourage her now to, you know, to not make the same, I, I don't call her mistake, but not make the same decisions that I made but to be in a better position than I was and to make better decisions. So I try to facilitate and help her um, to, be, to, to be that better person. We can't hear you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm back. I'm sorry, you guys. Okay. Um, so I keep um, unmuting again. myself, and it just mutes me again. Sorry, <laughs> Brittany, would you like to share? Yeah. So um, I'm Brittany We'd Daniels. Love to hear your journey. Thank you. I'm Brittany Daniels. I'm the founder of the Rare Old Project. Um, so I will first say that um, I'm a mom of three now, who did experience being a teen mom. Um, I always say that I was a little bit younger than everybody of the bunch because I feel like for me um, being 14 um, and having my son um, I don't usually run into other moms or have shared my journey with other moms that have been that young um, so for me it was a little bit more difficult because I was that young and made those choices I didn't get the support and stuff that I needed so I actually had to go through my journey alone um, um, and still to this day, you know, as far as like family, family supporting things like that, like I don't have, um, those type of people in my life, but my son then was my motivation and I now have three kids. So my three children are my motivation. Um, and I created, um, the organization that I have now, which is the rare old project to help support team moms, just because again, I've experienced it, um, you know, certain different um, obstacles back then, like homelessness and um, hardship, um, not having the support that I need. So I wanted to be a support to other moms. Um, so, yeah, that's just my overall journey. Um, and so far, um, again, for my son, who I had at 14, he did graduate from high school. So I take much pride uh, in that because, again, when everybody gave up on me, you know, I didn't give up on myself and, you know, we've been pushing forward. Um, and again, he graduated with a 3.5. So I always like to toot my horn with that because that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> that's a good thing because I did walk across the stage um, in junior high or in high school. I did ultimately get my diploma, but it wasn't the more traditional way that I would have hoped for. So for me, I want to make sure that. Um, I'm available and pushing my kids to make sure that they experience those things that I didn't experience. Um, so, yeah, um, that's me. And as far as the organization that I've created, we've been established for a year now. 
Um, so uh, again, it's just a support group for teen moms. I do babies essentials giveaways and things like that, just to kind of help support the community, you know, as much as I can to give back. Um, it's personal for me again, cause I've experienced, I love my team moms. I want to be there and do everything that I can. Um, and eventually open up a home to house team moms. So that's what I'm looking forward to in the near future. That's what I'm working so hard, um, to do. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, know a team mom or you are a team mom and you're looking for some support or just some extra essentials or anything like that, definitely reach out to us. We've been more than um, willing to help you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Another, another amazing <laughs> journey. And um, I, I like to call it testimony. Amen. Um, of just withstanding, you know, the trials and tribulations and um, overcoming. We'd like to ask if anyone out there and um, that, that's listening, if you have any questions for any of our uh, team moms that are on the panel, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll uh, go ahead and ask them. We'll wait a couple seconds to see if any questions are coming through. Awesome. So we have uh, someone that would love to support your work, Brittany, um, Ajua. So definitely, definitely connect. Again, uh, the description and links for all of our presenters, um, as well as uh, for you, Brittany, uh, will be in our sgrowcoversity.com um, and under national projects. So definitely connect, network. It's um, very important that we network and connect and support each other in this journey of making sure that our, our black and our, our brown children are um, alive and well, and our, our mothers are also alive and well. So we definitely appreciate you all. And if there's any more questions that are coming through, um, there's a question, how do we support the Rare O Project, Brittany? Um, so for me right now, because um, outside of me hosting the giveaways, um, I wanted to create, like I created a program so where I can be hands-on with team moms and kind of create the opportunities that I had hoped for. So whatever that may be, getting them in school, so many different types of things. So for me right now, because I am not doing any giveaways, um, I would just say if you were open to like donating, I don't have anything going on like right now, upcoming, like an event that I'm getting ready to host right now. But um, there's always T moms reaching out to me about needing babies essentials. You know, I do drop offs just one on one. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and again, sharing, awesome. um, sharing the information for any moms that may need assistance. Awesome. Um, for Renisha, how can we use some of um, some of us former team moms have support you realize your dreams? Wait, Renisha, how can some of us former team moms have support you you realize your dreams? Like how did some of the former team moms help support you realize your dreams? I think that's the question. Uh, oh, I think we lost Renisha. But in the meantime, as she's reconnecting, if you're interested in learning more about Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated and its programs, please check us out at sgrowcoversity.org. Please, please check us out. And again, um, a lot of our information that we shared on this evening will be posted under our national uh, projects. Dot com, sorry. Not dot org. <laughs> sgrowcoversity.com. <laughs> um, so, um, Renisha, uh, I'm sorry, Brittany, for your Rare O project, where are you located specifically? Is it within LA County? In Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Okay, so, if you're awesome. familiar with Lemur Park, um, that's where I've been, like, doing my giveaways. Like, I started off in the school system. Uh, when I decided to create my organization, I went to the school where I was a pregnant team mom that I attended. So that was the school that I went to to pitch what I wanted to do to let me present to the team moms in the school. Um, so that's where I started. But when the pandemic happened, you could no longer go into the school premises and things like that. So I just created a fire, 
use the community to spread the word and things like that. And I have been hosting them right here in Lamert Park um, awesome. since August. So I don't know if you just yeah. saw across the screen, um, Ajwa, who was one of our presenters, just said that they're providing postpartum bags at Black Women for Wellness. Woo-hoo! So let's collaborate. And they're in Lamert Park. So this is a perfect Amen. opportunity. And um, if you have like any other um, ways like we can help you, um, you know, raise funds and advocate during this time, yes. just let us know. I, um, collect items, you know, networking is very important during this time. So definitely reach out to Ajua because there's, there's some products there and, and items for your families that are in need. And Thank then you so much. Help, um, you're welcome. How do we help you, Renisha, realize and achieve uh, your dreams, Renisha? Um, honestly, um, and I know it's, it might seem like the corny answer or, you know. No corny answer. But <laughs> um, now I have four kids. So they're 16, 9, 4, and 1. And um, this year, well, last year I started... Um, looking for a house. So um, we pretty much, I can't say that I'm lacking. Um, my dream is to see my kids excel, honestly. And I, like I said, that's why I said, I know it seems like the corny answer. But like I said, um, my daughter's a junior in high school. And at this time, she's um, about to start filling out the college applications. And so I've even like put money into her account so that when she does the application, um, she can apply pay for it right away. So I do a lot of overtime and it's just about seeing them flourish and be the best citizens that they can possibly be, especially in these times. Um, Everything that I thought that, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I interrupted you. Sorry. Everything that I thought that, um, um, that was, I can say I wanted to be a lawyer. I went to school, I did criminal justice and, you know, but um, I haven't quit on going back to school, but my focus is on them. And when I see them flourish and I see their report cards and I see their accolades and everything that they do, I feel like a proud parent. And I feel like my purpose, honestly, um, because um, I love my mom, God rest her soul. Uh, I feel like my purpose was to become a mother, um, to help with, you know, uh, these young beings that unfortunately some, they get lost, but I'm able to guide my eyes in a, in a, in a way that's productive and um, help those that I see that are um, being led astray. I'm one of those people that if I see them in the streets that I'm like, Hey, you know you shouldn't be acting that way. You know, act accordingly because it's important for us as young women, as young men, to represent. You know, us and show people. You know, um, the greatness that we are. It so, definitely takes a um, village. I, like I said, it, it, it yeah, it does. It takes a village, and so my like I said. My success is measured through my kids. Like I said, it seems corny and it seems cliche, but corny, I love all four of my babies and and they've been my motivation and just seeing them succeed has just been the greatness for me. Well, just know it's never too late to go back. It's never too late. <laughs> You're right. So I, I've actually started real years. estate school. <laughs> yeah, I started real yeah, estate school. So, yeah, I'm trying to get a piece of that pie. <laughs> hey, it's out there for the taking. So go on and get it. Yes, awesome for, for you. Thank you, Renisha. For you, you've got the thank same. You. How how can we how can we support you? To help you realize your dreams. Hear me. Okay. Well, I'm from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. I'm out here in Los Angeles. Um, after Brianna went away to college and everything, I came out here to pursue my dream to be a screenwriter and television writer. So I'm still on that journey. Um, and yeah, that's the journey that I'm on right now. I was going to say, Renisha, are you in Chicago? I am in Chicago. Yes, I am. Because I was going to oh, say, wow. my daughter can <laughs> help. If you want, my daughter can help your daughter uh, fill out those co- college applications if you want uh-huh. to get her. Yes, all day. Yes, yes, I am. I appreciate it. Yes, yes. Thank love you. stuff like that. <laughs> yes, 
Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we I am down. I am Thank down. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us on this evening. We really appreciate you coming out. Um, I think we have two last giveaways. Um, we have uh, two $10 Amazon gift cards. So drum roll. Who's the lucky winner? Taryn McAmee. Awesome. Next for a $10 gift card, Camilla Cryer. Camilla Cryer, congratulations. Awesome. What an amazing night full of so much information and resources and beautiful, beautiful Black women just supporting and educating and providing us so much information. Please share the information with somebody you know, somebody you don't know. And once again, find all of the information in the description and links for all of our presenters and our panelists at um, sgroadculvercity.com under our national projects. Follow us, sgroadculvercity. And we thank you for attending our event and hopefully you'll be on the lookout for our other events that come that are coming. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for our panelists, presenters. Thank you.